they could also marvel at the extraordinary speed of surgery. In early 19th century London, surgeons didn't come any faster than the Scottish maverick Robert Liston. Liston performed in places like this, but he was more than just a sawbones. He was a great surgeon and a great performer who loved playing to the gallery. He never washed his hands before operating. Like most people at the time, he didn't understand the importance of hygiene, but he saved lives. Liston performed operations that other surgeons wouldn't touch. He would carve out tumours, amputate limbs and slash at gangrenous flesh, all on fully conscious patients. A man like Robert Liston wouldn't really have considered pain control at all, I don't think. He might have had the odd regret as the patient uh, screamed as the knife went in. But as he, as he did his work, he was really interested in how much he could impress the people who were watching him and how fast he could do his surgery. Could he beat his last time for a certain operation? Liston had to operate unbelievably fast before the patient was killed by shock from the pain. And that gave him his catchphrase. Time me, gentlemen. Time. From the patient's point of view, it was a whirlwind of black fear that would grip them. They would feel this sense that they had been abandoned into this, this terrible ordeal from which there was no escape. Liston would then slice through the flesh all the way round the limb, saw through the bone and stitch the wound flaps to stop a torrent of blood. Robert Liston was always very conscious of a, an amputation being done well. So he forms a flap out of your skin, almost like a dress pattern. The assistant must catch instantly the artery. The artery is tied and what's left at the end is a padded stump. As well as this sort of showman style that surrounded Liston, there was undoubtedly huge skill. He, he couldn't have written the books he wrote. Uh, he couldn't have, have done the operations he performed unless he was a highly skilled surgeon. Liston was so fast he could remove a limb in just 28 seconds before holding the severed stump up in the air. The audience loved it. But people needing operations weren't quite as keen. Before anaesthesia, patients knew they might die without surgery, but many were so scared they would let their complaints fester until they'd reached record proportions. Anyone who had a deformity or a growth would basically just have to live with it. Sometimes, to tremendous extremes, there are cases of women who had ovarian cysts that weighed more than they did, and they would have to suffer these rather than have surgery. One of Liston's patients is reported to have had a tumour on his scrotum so large he had to push it around in a wheelbarrow. But even if you'd agreed to surgery, that didn't mean you could bear to go through with it on the day. Another of Liston's patients was booked in for a bladder stone removal. This involved inserting this probe in through the penis and up to the bladder to locate the stone. Then you made a cut in between the legs and fished out the stone with a pair of tongs. Ta-da! Liston's patient was so scared of the bladder stone operation that he threw off the assistants restraining him and locked himself in the loo. Liston strode down the corridor and smashed down the door with his shoulder. He dragged his petrified patient back to the operating table and carried on with the procedure. Bladder stone operations are quite um, traumatic because of the region of the body. So the master cutters would do this very quickly. They got it from 45 minutes down to 45 seconds. And it's very high success rate on that. But the medical establishment hated Liston. Some accounts of his life suggest he perfected his study of anatomy by grave robbing. As soon as Liston qualified in Edinburgh, he started to operate on patients, often judged unsuitable for treatment by other surgeons. Many times he went to their houses to chop off a diseased limb. As one Edinburgh doctor put it, Before the days of anaesthetics, a patient was like a criminal awaiting execution. They counted the days, then the hours as they listened for the echo in the street of the surgeon, and watched for the pull of the doorbell, the foot on the stair, and the step into the room. The production of his dreaded instruments then surrendered their liberty and, revolting at the necessity, submitted to be held or bound and helplessly give themselves up to his cruel knife. Liston's contempt for his colleagues got him barred from the wards in Edinburgh. 
he moved to London where he was successful enough to afford a house here in Clifford Street, Mayfair. But his abrasive arrogance continued to make him unpopular, which might explain why all his surgical mistakes were so gleefully recorded. Liston's speed with the knife was bad news for one patient expecting to lose his leg. The knife went too far. The patient lost a testicle as well. One of Liston's assistants fared even worse. Whilst holding a patient's leg during an operation, Liston slashed off two of his fingers. He later died of septicemia. The patient also died in one of the first operations with a 200% mortality rate. There were pain relief agents around at the time, such as willow buck and mandrake, but Liston had very little time for them. If you were lucky, you might get roaring drunk before the operation, but usually the surgeon wouldn't let you. He'd like you to be conscious so he could tell if you were still alive. Alcohol is not advocated by surgeons at all. Um, it's basically because uh, the blood flow is increased. If you're a surgeon, your worst enemy is the release of artery, blood. You need to tie it quickly. Robert Liston is a great user of forcep clamp. But alcohol and the other pills and potions available couldn't counter such extreme pain. Something more potent needed to be found before Liston would be interested. In 1846, a butler called Churchill was waiting to be called up to the operating theatre here at University College Hospital. He was due to have his leg cut off by Robert Liston, the showman surgeon. But at the last minute, Liston decided to try something that would either kill the butler or change the history of medicine. On y va. S-type twin turbo diesel, another high performance car from Jaguar. Free in this week's zoo, the ultimate Euro Zoo 2004 supporters kit with a free beer token. Zoo, all the wicked goodness a man needs. David Redshaw. Yeah. This I believe is yours. You left it in a bar the other night. Now there's nothing wrong with that. But when you consider that beer's a Heineken, it becomes a different matter. I don't... Come on, let me explain. <laughs> See, David, Heineken has changed. It's now imported from Holland. We got rid of the 3.4%. It's now the 5% ABV you drink abroad. And why, David? We believe it makes our beer better. So when we see people not appreciating all the efforts we've gotten to, it makes us kind of upset. Gentlemen, I think David knows what to do now. David, that's disgusting. Next time you order Heineken, just remember how it's made. Ah! <laughs> what do we got? Paul Walters built this pint last Thursday. Let's go. It's a funny old world. Things keep disappearing. Where's that gone? That was our new soft lotion. It disappears twice as fast as ever before. All you'll find is perfect baby soft skin. New Johnson's Baby Soft Lotion. Can't make me disappear. In my mind, this 
celebration, sweetest of sensation, thinking you could be mine. I should be so lucky. Lucky, lucky, lucky. I should be so lucky in love. In 1841, a group of men in the American town of Jefferson asked their doctor if he would help them have a good time. He gave them some ether, a medicine used for chest complaints. They inhaled it. They began giggling. They felt lightheaded. They fell over. And most important of all, they didn't feel a thing. The doctor, Crawford Long, saw the bruises, heard that there had been no pain, and made a connection that no one else had spotted. Could this be the answer to the problem of pain in operations? Other medics were coming to the same conclusion as Long. In 1846, in Boston, Massachusetts, the dentist William Morton gave ether as an anaesthetic for the first time. Word soon spread to London about this amazing new substance. The scene was now set for a far more ambitious experiment, and there was one surgeon determined to be in charge of it. On the 21st of December, 1846, Robert Liston strode into his operating theatre and announced to his audience... We're going to do a Yankee dodge today, gentlemen. Hold it! Liston was determined to be the first surgeon in London to use this new anaesthetic. Before administering the ether to his patient, it was tested on a hospital porter. The dosage was wrong and it didn't work. The patient, Frederick Churchill, was now terrified. It was quite a, an experiment, in inverted commas, that, that Liston was performing here. Nobody had given an anaesthetic much before, so they didn't know how much to give or how long to give it before the surgeon could start. And they hadn't really any idea what the effects of the anaesthetic were going to be. An eyewitness said that when the ether was put under Churchill's nose, he gurgled and went limp. Liston went to work with his trademark speed. The leg was cut and cauterized in an extraordinary 28 seconds. But he needn't have rushed. The only noise from his patient was deep breathing. At the end, Liston nodded to his assistant to remove the ether. The butler's next words changed the course of medical history. When are we going to begin? The day after Churchill's amputation, a London newspaper screamed, We have conquered pain. Booklets were published, new applicators developed, everything had changed. Patients who'd been too frightened to have surgery started to queue up for an operation. Liston's enthusiasm for anaesthetics was soon matched by some solid thinking. Another doctor, John Snow, began to turn pain control into a science. Snow produced tables showing the correct amounts of ether to be given. He also invented new, more convenient inhalers for patients. Liston's charisma and Snow's advances turned the discovery of anaesthetics into a public sensation. And whole new types of surgery became possible. Before the arrival of anaesthetics to knock out the patient, it was virtually impossible to operate on places like the stomach. The intestines were all pushing against you the whole time and might even come right outside the human body. Once that had happened, it was very hard to get them back in again because of this tension in the, in the muscles. So the surgeons would fight for hours pushing things back in and trying to stitch you up again. Once you had anesthesia, the muscles became more and more relaxed. So at a certain point, you could stitch them up very, very easily. And this revolutionized surgery which meant good news for patients. And bad news for Robert Liston's audiences. You no longer had to operate at lightning speed. You could take your time. The sense of relief was summed up by Lady Paget, wife of the chief surgeon here at Barts Hospital in London. She launched a campaign for an anaesthetics day, a national holiday to celebrate the day pain was conquered. When asked why it was so significant to her, Lady Paget explained that she lived next to the operating theatres at Barts and had to close all the windows or go shopping during surgery because she couldn't bear all the screams. No! But with the euphoria building, the shortcomings of ether started to become clear. It made patients throw up their entire stomach contents and was also mildly explosive. Many of the operations conducted in front of the roaring fires of consulting rooms 
had disastrous results. The use of a face mask could also pose problems. It made surgery on the jaw difficult. It was uncomfortable for some patients. So Victorian doctors learned to administer ether into the other end of the patient. Ether's many drawbacks meant the search was on to find an alternative. It came in the form of a substance pioneered by a teenage chemist called Humphrey Davy. As you start to breathe it, you get more and more euphoric. Uh, you become more and more disinhibited, so your behaviour, instead of being calm and measured, suddenly starts to become more and more uh, outlandish. Davy heated ammonium nitrate and, like any good anaesthetics inventor, tested the effects on himself. In 1799, he had himself shut in an airtight box. Then his new substance was blown in. Davy described the experience. My sensations were pleasant. A disposition to muscular exertion and merriment. Trains of vivid images passed through my mind and were connected with words in such a manner as to produce perceptions perfectly novel. Davy had stumbled across nitrous oxide, which he christened laughing gas. It would transform a visit to the dentist and pave a way for surgeries like this. But nobody realised that when it was first discovered. They'd found perhaps the most exciting thing they were ever going to discover, which was a, a way of producing painless surgery. And what did he do about it? Absolutely nothing. He kept it with his friends, breathed it, used it as a recreational drug. Uh, they had great parties with it. The medical profession ignored nitrous oxide for the next 30 years, but the travelling showman loved it. Public displays of laughing gas became a regular at fun fairs. This description dates from 1844. Twelve young men have volunteered to inhale the gas to commence the entertainment. The gas will be administered only to gentlemen of the first respectability. The object is to make the entertainment in every respect a genteel affair. These genteel affairs involving young men hallucinating dangerously were well known. And with doctors buzzing about the discovery of ether, it was soon realised laughing gas might also be used as an anaesthetic. Having a tooth removed was a common and painful operation at the time. American dentist Horace Wells believed so passionately in this new substance that he had one of his own healthy teeth taken out under nitrous oxide to show it didn't hurt. Then he decided to demonstrate to the rest of his profession. Unfortunately, it didn't go very well for Wells because having put the patient seemingly asleep, he pulled on the tooth to be extracted and the patient shouted. And so Wells was booed and hissed and, and left the room in disgrace. But Wells knew that it worked because it, it, it had worked for him and it was working for other patients. Laughing gas changed dentistry forever. It would have been particularly appreciated in those days before six monthly checkups and fluoride toothpaste. But nitrous oxide still wasn't the perfect anaesthetic. It was too weak to knock the patient out. There had to be something better. And celebrity sawbones Robert Liston was determined to find it. Liston had performed the first surgery under anaesthetic in Europe in December 1846. He spent that Christmas at home in London with Dr James Simpson, an old friend from Edinburgh who had also caught the anaesthetic's bug. After some bizarre experiments, he discovered something even better than ether and laughing gas, and then stumbled into a blazing row about whether he should be allowed to use it. Simpson was fired up with enthusiasm about ether. He immediately rushed back to Edinburgh to try it on his own patients in childbirth. He at once recognised that ether did have some drawbacks. He wanted to look for something with all the advantages of ether, but none of the disadvantages, and that was what he set out to do. Simpson went in search of any substance that would vaporise. He wanted to know which ones would send you off to sleep if inhaled. Over the next few months, Simpson and his assistant inhaled acetone, benzene, chloride of hydrocarbon and dozens of other chemicals in search of something that would knock him out. As you can imagine, this had a very bad effect on him. Uh, frequently, he found himself so hoarse in his throat that he couldn't lecture the next day. He was sometimes laid up in bed and ill for a, quite a while after the experiments. Uh, his family were clearly quite upset about it, but nothing was ever going to dissuade him from carrying on. 
On the 4th of November, 1847, as Simpson groggily worked his way through the shelves of the local pharmacy, he eventually found a solvent called chloroform. It was good, very good. Simpson was found unconscious on the floor. When he came round, he didn't remember a thing. Simpson, in his life um, as an obstetrician, had seen many complicated births and labours. I mean, because of poor nutrition in those days, many women had deformed pelvises and they'd suffered horrendously. And very often the child died and there was a high mortality rate amongst the mothers too. He had seen enormous suffering. Um, he was quite sensitive to the suffering of his patients and he wanted to alleviate it. Simpson was right about the agonies of childbirth. I've worked on a labour ward like this and seen women determined to give birth without any drugs. I've seen them ripping their husband's hair out, I've seen them biting the arm, I've seen them wailing like a banshee until they finally give in and have some drugs because the pain is so bad. It's a process that was once described to us male doctors as trying to push a basketball out of your back passage. Simpson was determined to bring some relief to this process and put some fizz into his social life at the same time. He set up a dinner party for the cream of Edinburgh society. Once the plates were cleared away, Simpson's guests were each given a glass of fizzy water mixed with chloroform. One, two, three, down! Simpson became so merry, he's reported to have stood on his head. Other guests fancied themselves as angels or broke out in uncontrollable laughter. The party decided the stuff was so potent they wanted it taken away. Well, those guests who were given the chloroform champagne described it as heady. I imagine that they were feeling distinctly light-headed, intoxicated, possibly um, uh, maybe a little aroused, one feels, because it did have this slight aphrodisiac effect. Anyway, it wasn't the kind of thing you needed at a Victorian dinner table. Below stairs, the cook decided to try this exciting beverage herself. She too passed out. Simpson was now convinced this was the stuff to give to pregnant women. But his plan to give women pain relief during childbirth hit an unexpected obstacle. There was one clergyman in particular who said that chloroform was a decoy of Satan designed to rob God of the deep earnest cries that ar arise in times of trouble. Simpson fought back against the religious objections. He published his own pamphlets and produced articles arguing that if you're going to condemn chloroform on biblical grounds, you could argue that travelling in a carriage or wearing a hat also goes against God's will. But it wasn't just the church that was against chloroform. Doctors opposed chloroform for a variety of reasons. Some of them said quite rightly, we just don't know what it does to the human body. And then, of course, there was Dr. Green, who said that it caused erotic dreams. He actually said that one woman had offered to kiss the male attendant while she was giving birth. This was something he found personally revolting and thought that women would rather die than have this happen to them. He also said that women under the influence of chloroform uttered coarse language, in itself sufficient reason that it should never be given to English women. The tide of public opinion began to shift as two celebrity mothers opted for a chloroform birth. Kate Dickens, the wife of Charles, was about to give birth to her eighth child. Dickens had met Simpson and been enthused about chloroform. Then, in 1849, when Kate gave birth to Henry Fielding Dickens, she did so with the assistance of chloroform. Afterwards, Dickens wrote that the shock to his wife's nervous system was reduced to nothing, and she was, to all intents and purposes, well the next day. Dickens' writings widened interest in chloroform. Then, in 1853, the most famous celebrity mother imaginable joined the cause. Queen Victoria was pregnant with Prince Leopold. Having endured seven agonizing deliveries, she decided that pain during labor was not a divinely appointed gift, whatever the men of the church said. I think Queen Victoria opted for a chloroform birth for the same reason as any woman would do. She found the birth experience extremely painful, 
and she'd heard good things about chloroform. And certainly, uh, the two previous births, she'd made inquiries about it, but it had never quite got to the stage of actually agreeing to. And then for the birth of Prince Leopold, they asked Dr. Snow to come to court, and he put on his best hat and his sword, and off he went. Queen Victoria became a great fan of chloroform, with some startling consequences. When her eldest daughter, Vicky, was about to give birth, she sent her a bottle of chloroform. Vicky's labour was lengthy and complicated. It was believed that both she and the baby would die. Fortunately, a doctor arrived who knew how to use chloroform. Vicky inhaled it, and he was able to turn the baby, which was in a breech position, to enable it to be born normally. The baby looked dead. He applied artificial respiration, and at last, it took its first breath, and it survived. That child was the future Kaiser Wilhelm II, who led Germany into the First World War. Simpson eventually won his battle, and chloroform became a mainstay of anaesthetics for childbirth and other operations. His opponents were gracious in defeat. After his death, a memorial honouring Simpson's work was erected in Westminster Abbey. So, after two years of intense excitement, the world had gone from having no anaesthetics to having three of them. Chloroform, ether and laughing gas. And the hunt was on for the perfect knockout drug with no side effects. Was this the end to pain during surgery? Well, not quite. One senior doctor, surrounded by traumatised young men, shot at by cannons like these during the Crimean War, decided pain relief was for wimps. He tried to ban anaesthetics. <laughs> When you In 1854, Britain and Russia went to war in the Crimea. It was the most severe winter in living memory. Dr. John Hall was appointed the chief of medical staff. He had his own views about the newfangled anaesthetics. The smart use of the knife is a powerful stimulant. It is much better to hear a man bawl lustily than to see him sink quietly into his grave. Hall believed that soldiers about to be operated on should be given a bullet or a leather belt to bite on, not chloroform. John Hall had become the chief medical officer in the army. He'd been promoted up through the ranks. He had little experience of modern surgery and anaesthesia. Uh, he only knew what he had read in the journals and from anecdotal references that chloroform could be dangerous. As an army doctor, he expected the soldiers to be brave and withstand pain without the aid of anaesthesia. Hall's edict split the medical establishment. Florence Nightingale, who established a hospital in the war zone, described him as a fossil of the pure red sandstone. But it was a contentious subject. Even the patients weren't sure they wanted anaesthetizing. The average soldier was illiterate, but they were brave men. And they were afraid of this new anaesthesia because they thought as they were going to sleep, they would give away their life secrets. There was something in John Hall's view. In states of extreme shock, like when you've had your leg blown off on the battlefield, the mixture of endorphins and adrenaline can help stave off the pain. But the effect is only temporary and you can be in a desperate state by the time you finally reach the field hospital. The majority of surgeons ignored their commander's instructions and used chloroform. The doctors in the Crimea did not follow John Hall's instructions. Most of them had been trained in Scotland or Ireland. They knew the benefits of chloroform. They did not want to see men screaming and crying with pain when they knew they had chloroform. Not only that, they were able to take a little longer with the operations. They were able to stop the bleeding and therefore the men would be more likely to survive. But whilst it was good in battlefield situations, chloroform wasn't the perfect knockout drug. The first patient to make that clear was 15-year-old Hannah Greener. In January 1848, Hannah was about to have an operation to remove an ingrowing toenail. The doctor decided to use chloroform. It was a fatal decision. After going under, Hannah turned pale. They tried to revive her by giving her tots of brandy and opening the window. But Hannah had died. 
the first recorded fatality of chloroform. I think Hannah Green had died because she was so nervous. The nervousness created a lot of adrenaline in her body. That combined with the chloroform to cause a dysrhythmia in her heart. And because she had that dysrhythmia, the heart stopped. Up until the 1860s, the problem with anaesthetics was that you knocked the whole patient out. Sometimes you just wanted to knock part of them out. The equipment necessary to do this was invented in France in the mid-19th century. The big question was, what do you put in the syringe? There was one substance, distilled from the coca plant, that was known to have medicinal properties. In 1860, Albert Nyman purified this strange compound. He called it cocaine. It became the world's first effective local anaesthetic. One doctor was so enthused by cocaine, he used it to conduct an operation on himself. This has to be one of the most extraordinary pictures of all time. Here is a surgeon who has not only put in his own spinal anaesthetic by pushing a needle through his back into his cerebrospinal fluid, he's then administered cocaine into that fluid, removed the needle, gone numb from the waist down, and is now sitting there repairing his own hernia. The two stalwarts on either side were there to give him encouragement, to help him, and occasionally to give him a bit of a shake or slap him around the face, because every now and then he'd pull a bit hard on what he was operating on, and he might faint from various reflexes, and so he had to be brought round again uh, before he could continue with the procedure. The doctors who embraced cocaine professionally also tried it out on themselves with more and more enthusiasm. And that became a problem. Look through the hastily published research papers of the time and you find babbling incoherent nonsense. Cocaine had turned many of its former advocates into dribbling basket cases. Many of whom then died, which didn't help the research process. But the search did begin for a non-addictive form of cocaine. It ended in 1905 with a derivative of cocaine called Novocaine. For decades afterwards, it helped people cope with a regular but unpleasant experience. The realisation that cocoa leaves could be made into a powerful drug led some researchers to look for another drug made from a plant. They knew about the drug from old books, but they didn't know which plant it came from. And the people who did know weren't telling. The Amazonian Indians had paralysing arrows loaded with a homemade drug called curare that they used to hunt animals. A 19th century explorer had brought samples of curare back to London and found it had unusual properties. What happens is it circulates round in the bloodstream and uh, blocks the transmission of impulses between nerves and muscles. And so the muscles, not getting that nervous uh, transmission, relax completely. But no one was going to find out what this stuff was until someone tore themselves away from the textbooks and went off to ask the Amazonian people how they made this thick black paste that had such a devastating effect. That project was undertaken by Richard Gill, a medical school dropout with a love of adventure but progressive paralysis of the muscles. In 1938, Gill decided he would go into the jungle and bring back the secret of Karari. For five months he lived among the local people, seeking out and preparing the plants they used to make the drug. Gill discovered a lot about jungle medicine from his new friends, partly because he was so ill while he was out there. But his mission was accomplished. He returned with 25 pounds of curare and the information that it was made from a plant called Condidendron tomentosum. Two things happened for Gill when he got back to researchers here in London with his momentous discovery. Firstly, the drug companies weren't interested. Secondly, his illness was diagnosed as multiple sclerosis, which Curare then was thought to partly cure. Gill died in 1958, but by this time Curare had become widely accepted by the medical world and was an essential part of 20th century anaesthetics. It had a unique effect. What happens is profound muscle relaxation. So you're not giving so much poison to the patient with all the inhalational agents, and you can run a very light anaesthetic with the patient unconscious. This allows the surgeon en entry into the body cavities. By the 1930s, it was clear anaesthetics were getting more and more sophisticated. Unfortunately, the people giving them weren't. Before the Association of Anaesthetics existed, Anyone in the operating theatre was allowed to have a go at pumping knockout drugs into patients. 
As one professor put it, anaesthetists are at the bottom of the professional hierarchy, with a high proportion of dimwits, no-hopers and drunks. Clearly, something had to be done. There were uh, undoubtedly calamities that took place because anaesthesia wasn't of a high standard or of the same high standard across the country. So, the so-called dimwits, no-hopers and drunks got together and decided to set exams for their profession and establish the Association of Anaesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland. They needed to do it, they said, because of all the developments in their specialty. One of the most scary was intubation, putting a tube down the patient's throat so a machine could make them breathe while they were unconscious. I used to do intubations when I was a junior doctor, and the equipment hasn't changed much since the 1930s. You use a laryngoscope for clearing the tongue out of the way, and you should see two holes. Hopefully you put the tube into the breathing hole, the windpipe, and the brain gets some oxygen. If you put it into the gullet by mistake, you can kill the patient. So, no pressure there. It's hard enough getting this right on adults, but I've had to do it on tiny screaming newborn babies. Which is frankly really frightening. Other developments kept anaesthetists on their toes. New ways of knocking people out, monitoring them while they were out, bringing them back and keeping their bodies functioning. It put massive responsibilities on the knockout doctors, who spend their day taking patients as close to death as possible. When you're dealing with somebody's life being held in your hand, uh, then you have to concentrate every second on what's going on. You have to watch every heartbeat, you have to watch every breath, balancing the drugs that are being given, the pain relief, the sedation, the muscle relaxants, getting everything just right, taking over the normal functions of the, the, of the patient, keeping them safe, and then bringing them back again afterwards. Other drugs emerged with new properties. Halothane could knock you out in two minutes, rather than the usual five to ten. New ways of administering anaesthetics were also discovered. One of the most significant was demonstrated in the dunked dog experiment. This extraordinary picture shows a dog upside down in a tank of water under an anaesthetic. And what this demonstrated was that you can have truly closed circuit anesthesia with a cuff inflated, not even being underwater, would allow anything to pass down into the lungs of the, of the animal or the patient unless it was delivered through that anesthetic delivery system. The dunked dog experiment meant that for the first time a machine could effectively breathe for the patient and the use of powerful anaesthetic gases like cyclopropane meant that patients could be knocked out with just a small amount of the drug. The other advantage of cyclopropane was how quickly it worked. Just four breaths would knock out the average adult. But in October 1938, a woman was under the knife when the most dramatic side effect of this strange substance became clear. An almighty bang was heard in the operating theater. A doctor rushed into the aftermath of an explosion. The patient had her throat blown out and had expanded like a balloon with air forced under her skin. She died 18 hours later. New guidelines were issued, but no one wanted to lose such a fast-acting, if highly explosive, anaesthetic. For years, operations continued using small doses of cyclopropane. It was finally withdrawn in 1996. Cyclopropane was really a wonderful anaesthetic agent for its time. It produced such a rapid onset of anaesthesia, you could use very high concentrations of oxygen with it, so that for the really sick patient it was a very dramatic anaesthetic to use. The next big sensation in anaesthetics happened in 1964. A drug that could be carried in a bottle, and after that... In 1854, Britain and Russia went to war in the Crimea. It was the most severe winter in living memory. Dr. John Hall was appointed the chief of medical staff. He had his own views about the newfangled anaesthetics. The smart use of the knife is a powerful stimulant. It is much better to hear a man bawl lustily than to see him sink quietly into his grave. Paul believed that soldiers about to be operated on should be given a bullet or a leather belt to bite on, not chloroform. 
John Hall had become the chief medical officer in the army. He'd been promoted up through the ranks. He had little experience of modern surgery and anesthesia. Uh, he only knew what he had read in the journals and from anecdotal references that chloroform could be dangerous. As an army doctor, he expected the soldiers to be brave and withstand pain without the aid of anesthesia. Hall's edict split the medical establishment. Florence Nightingale, who established a hospital in the war zone, described him as a fossil of the pure red sandstone. But it was a contentious subject. Even the patients weren't sure they wanted anaesthetizing. The average soldier was illiterate, but they were brave men. And they were afraid of this new anesthesia because they thought as they were going to sleep, they would give away their life secrets there was something in John Hall's view. In states of extreme shock, like when you've had your leg blown off on the battlefield, the mixture of endorphins and adrenaline can help stave off the pain. But the effect is only temporary and you can be in a desperate state by the time you finally reach the field hospital. The majority of surgeons ignored their commander's instructions and used chloroform. The doctors in the Crimea did not follow John Hall's instructions. Most of them had been trained in Scotland or Ireland. They knew the benefits of chloroform. They did not want to see men screaming and crying with pain when they knew they had chloroform. Not only that, they were able to take a little longer with the operations. They were able to stop the bleeding and therefore the men would be more likely to survive. But whilst it was good in battlefield situations, chloroform wasn't the perfect knockout drug. The first patient to make that clear was 15-year-old Hannah Greener. In January 1848, Hannah was about to have an operation to remove an ingrowing toenail. The doctor decided to use chloroform. It was a fatal decision. After going under, Hannah turned pale. They tried to revive her by giving her tots of brandy and opening the window. But Hannah had died, the first recorded fatality of chloroform. I think Hannah Green had died because she was so nervous. The nervousness created a lot of adrenaline in her body. That combined with the chloroform to cause a dysrhythmia in her heart. And because she had that dysrhythmia, the heart stopped. Up until the 1860s, the problem with anaesthetics was that you knocked the whole patient out. Sometimes you just wanted to knock part of them out. The equipment necessary to do this was invented in France in the mid-19th century. The big question was, what do you put in the syringe? There was one substance, distilled from the coca plant, that was known to have medicinal properties. In 1860, Albert Nyman purified this strange compound. He called it cocaine. It became the world's first effective local anaesthetic. One doctor was so enthused by cocaine, he used it to conduct an operation on himself. This has to be one of the most extraordinary pictures of all time. Here is a surgeon who has not only put in his own spinal anaesthetic by pushing a needle through his back into his cerebrospinal fluid, he's then administered cocaine into that fluid, removed the needle, gone numb from the waist down, and is now sitting there repairing his own hernia. The two stalwarts on either side were there to give him encouragement, to help him, and occasionally to give him a bit of a shake or slap him around the face, because every now and then he'd pull a bit hard on what he was operating on, and he might faint from various reflexes, and so he had to be brought round again uh, before he could continue with the procedure. The doctors who embraced cocaine professionally also tried it out on themselves with more and more enthusiasm, and that became a problem. Look through the hastily published research papers of the time and you find babbling, incoherent nonsense. Cocaine had turned many of its former advocates into dribbling basket cases. Many of whom then died, which didn't help the research process. But the search did begin for a non-addictive form of cocaine. It ended in 1905 with a derivative of cocaine called Novocaine. For decades afterwards, it helped people cope with a regular but unpleasant experience. 
The realization that cocoa leaves could be made into a powerful drug led some researchers to look for another drug made from a plant. They knew about the drug from old books, but they didn't know which plant it came from. And the people who did know weren't telling. The Amazonian Indians had paralyzing arrows loaded with a homemade drug called curare that they used to hunt animals. A 19th century explorer had brought samples of curare back to London and found it had unusual properties. What happens is it circulates around in the bloodstream and uh, blocks the transmission of impulses between nerves and muscles. And so the muscles, not getting that nervous uh, transmission, relax completely. But no one was going to find out what this stuff was until someone tore themselves away from the textbooks and went off to ask the Amazonian people how they made this thick black paste that had such a devastating effect. That project was undertaken by Richard Gill, a medical school dropout with a love of adventure but progressive paralysis of the muscles. In 1938, Gill decided he would go into the jungle and bring back the secret of Karari. For five months he lived among the local people, seeking out and preparing the plants they used to make the drug. Gill discovered a lot about jungle medicine from his new friends, partly because he was so ill while he was out there. But his mission was accomplished. He returned with 25 pounds of curare and the information that it was made from a plant called Condidendron tomentosum. Two things happened for Gill when he got back to researchers here in London with his momentous discovery. Firstly, the drug companies weren't interested. Secondly, his illness was diagnosed as multiple sclerosis, which Curare then was thought to partly cure. Gill died in 1958, but by this time Curare had become widely accepted by the medical world and was an essential part of 20th century anaesthetics. It had a unique effect. What happens is profound muscle relaxation. So you're not giving so much poison to the patient with all the inhalational agents, and you can run a very light anaesthetic with the patient unconscious. This allows the surgeon en entry into the body cavities. By the 1930s, it was clear anaesthetics were getting more and more sophisticated. Unfortunately, the people giving them weren't. Before the Association of Anaesthetics existed, Anyone in the operating theatre was allowed to have a go at pumping knockout drugs into patients. As one professor put it, anaesthetists are at the bottom of the professional hierarchy, with a high proportion of dimwits, no-hopers and drunks. Clearly, something had to be done. There were uh, undoubtedly calamities that took place because anaesthesia wasn't of a high standard, or of the same high standard across the country. So, the so-called dimwits, no-hopers and drunks got together and decided to set exams for their profession and established the Association of Anaesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland. They needed to do it, they said, because of all the developments in their specialty. One of the most scary was intubation, putting a tube down the patient's throat so a machine could make them breathe while they were unconscious. I used to do intubations when I was a junior doctor, and the equipment hasn't changed much since the 1930s. You use a laryngoscope for clearing the tongue out of the way, and you should see two holes. Hopefully you put the tube into the breathing hole, the windpipe, and the brain gets some oxygen. If you put it into the gullet by mistake, you can kill the patient. So, no pressure there. It's hard enough getting this right on adults, but I've had to do it on tiny screaming newborn babies. Which is frankly really frightening. Other developments kept anaesthetists on their toes. New ways of knocking people out, monitoring them while they were out, bringing them back and keeping their bodies functioning. It put massive responsibilities on the knockout doctors, who spend their day taking patients as close to death as possible. When you're dealing with somebody's life being held in your hand, uh, then you have to concentrate every second on what's going on. You have to watch every heartbeat, you have to watch every breath, balancing the drugs that are being given, the pain relief, the sedation, the muscle relaxants, getting everything just right, taking over the normal functions of the, the, of the patient, keeping them safe, and then bringing them back again afterwards. Other drugs emerged with new properties. Halothane could knock you out in two minutes, rather than the usual five to ten. New ways of administering anaesthetics were also discovered. One of the most significant was demonstrated in the dunked dog experiment. This extraordinary picture shows a dog 
upside down in a tank of water under an anaesthetic. And what this demonstrated was that you can have truly closed circuit anesthesia with a cuff inflated, not even being underwater, would allow anything to pass down into the lungs of the, of the animal or the patient unless it was delivered through that anesthetic delivery system. The dunked dog experiment meant that for the first time a machine could effectively breathe for the patient. And the use of powerful anaesthetic gases like cyclopropane meant that patients could be knocked out with just a small amount of the drug. The other advantage of cyclopropane was how quickly it worked. Just four breaths would knock out the average adult. But in October 1938, a woman was under the knife when the most dramatic side effect of this strange substance became clear. An almighty bang was heard in the operating theatre. A doctor rushed into the aftermath of an explosion. The patient had her throat blown out and had expanded like a balloon with air forced under her skin. She died 18 hours later. New guidelines were issued, but no one wanted to lose such a fast-acting, if highly explosive, anaesthetic. <laughs> 